Time to take a look at the origins of the Japanese tank arm, which we spice up with some footage from TankFest 2019, where the Type 95 Hago light tank made a few rounds. Now, although Japanese tanks during the Second World War had a very limited impact, the situation was quite different pre-war. Indeed, Japanese tank production in the 1930s was much greater than that of many European armies due to the conflict in China. Japan was in the forefront of tank technology in the 1930s, introducing a number of innovations, such as diesel tank engines. There are quite many misconceptions and surprises about the Japanese tank arm out there. Additionally, as so often with non-Western forces, the source situation is not the best, and I encountered more inconsistencies between the different sources than ever before. Anyway, let's get started. Although the Japanese were not majorly engaged in the First World War, they were watching. One author notes, the army clearly discerned the importance of tanks from the reports of the First World War and launched a real, if modest, effort to incorporate them into their force. Yet at the same time, the influence of the tank in World War I was limited and the interpretations were mixed. Additionally, Europe is quite different to East Asia. Furthermore, Japan was not an industrial powerhouse back then. Tanks, for example, had mixed results during World War I, and the post-war debate in Europe, the United States and Japan reflected the misgivings about the proper role for the new weapon. The Japanese army worried that the lack of roads, heavy load-bearing bridges in China or Northeast Asia would further restrict the tanks' already limited mobility. Japan's inadequate heavy industry base made it difficult to manufacture tanks, and the nation's narrow gauge railroads made it difficult to move them. Shortly after the First World War, the Japanese acquired several British MKA Whippet tanks, and also several French Renault FT tanks, which was probably the most advanced World War I tank that was fielded in large numbers. Similar to Poland, Finland and others, Japan built its tank arm on the foundations of the Renault. Yet we must also look at the fundamental discussion about whether tanks for the Japanese army would make any sense at all. In 1921, the War Ministry established the Army Technical Headquarters Weapons Research and Policy Board to identify new weapons and equipment suitable for either positional or mobile warfare, yet compatible with the Army's current strategy and tactical doctrine. The Japanese faced several problems. First, the tank was not a proven technology. Second, the infrastructure was lacking. Third, Japanese industry was lacking and the Navy required most of the steel. And I'm totally not looking at you here, Yamato. Fourth, by East Asian standards, the Japanese had already high quality equipment. Yet they also considered by using an inferior Asian standard as its baseline for designing weaponry for regional wars with backward nations, army leaders understood that they were falling behind Western military trends of modernization as well as innovations in command and control and tactical doctrine. It made little sense, however, to modernize ground forces to European standards when Japan would likely be fighting poorly armed Chinese warlord forces. As such, it is quite understandable that the Japanese invested only a limited extent in tank development. Nevertheless, as mentioned in the intro, they achieved quite a lot especially if we consider this fact. By 1940, the Japanese tank force was the fifth largest in the world, following those of the Soviet Union, France, Britain and Germany. Japanese tank units played a key role in the early victories of December 1941, January 1942 against the US Army in the Philippines and the British Army in Malaya. As such, let's look at how the Japanese were able to build up a sizable tank force till 1940. At first, the Japanese tried to purchase more tanks, but they could only acquire Renaults. War Minister Ugaki presented his army reorganization plan to the nine-member military board of councillors in March 1925. Most of the savings, however, went to fund two tank units, new anti-aircraft units, research and development expenses, and ten new aircraft squadrons, which were paired with the existing six to form eight air regiments. And the first two tanks units were created in 1925. One at Kurume at the 12th Divisions Depot, which is located on the southern Japanese main island Kyushu. This unit used French Renault FTs. 
whereas the second was created at the Chiba Infantry School, which was located on the largest Japanese main island, Honshu. This unit used British weapon tanks. A few years later, the first tanks were deployed to China. In 1931, one platoon of Renault tanks was sent to Manchuria and there it was mated with the armored car platoon of the Kwantung Army to form a provisional armored company. Additional Renaults and personnel were sent in 1932 and a full tank company was formed. The tank company participated in the Yehol campaign, performing well. Note that these were likely not Renault FT-17s, but the successor NC-27 Renaults which the Japanese purchased in the 1920s and called Otsugata Senza. Fast forward a few years, in 1934, the Japanese created a mechanized combined arms unit. It was called the 1st Independent Mixed Brigade or Kunjuling Mechanized Mixed Brigade, depending on the source. It consisted of two tank battalions, one motorized infantry battalion, one motorized artillery battalion, one reconnaissance company and one motorized engineer company. Another source notes that it consisted only of one tank battalion, yet a motorized infantry regiment, not just a battalion, a field artillery battalion and an engineer company. This source also gives the number of tanks. The fourth tank battalion was built around three tank companies, each with 15 light tanks along with a headquarters with five more light tanks, plus two cars and five trucks, and a depot. The depot held 10 more light tanks as an equipment reserve. The depot also included a small maintenance section with four repair trucks. This setup might be how the brigade looked when it was mobilized in 1937 for the deployment in China, since the other source notes that the 2nd tank battalion was not deployed. So how did the brigade perform in China? Well, both forces agreed that it did not well, but when it comes to details, well, Take your own pick. The mechanized mixed brigade did not prove an unqualified success. The wheeled vehicles of the brigade were not able to keep up with the tanks in the trackless steps, particularly in winter. Elements of the brigade and the 3rd tank battalion participated in combat in North China with undistinguished results. Whereas the other source notes, the difficult terrain in China proved troublesome. The early tanks were slow and breakdowns frequent, preventing them from keeping pace with the mobile infantry. However, the worst problem was a lack of understanding of the capabilities and limitations of mechanized units on the part of the conservative generals. Now I have a problem with both sources. Ness has information that is sometimes rather imprecise and seems wrong. For instance, the purchase of British and French tanks seems too late according to all other sources. The problem with Rotman and Takizawa is that they note that the Japanese generals dismissed combined arms units with tanks. After returning from China, the commander of the mixed brigade Sakai was dismissed and the Kwantung army disbanded the independent brigade. And the tanks were again regulated solely to infantry support when temporarily attached to infantry formations. A little bit further down, even after the Nomohan incident, Many Imperial Japanese generals refused to admit the superiority of armored forces. And here's a bit of a problem, since the most trusted source, namely Alvin Cooks and Edward Dreher, note the following. The Imperial Japanese army had many hopes of quantitative as well as qualitative improvements to cope with strategic goals. For example, armored formations began to attract more serious attention after 1937 and the mechanized headquarters was finally set up in April 1941. There was talk of forming 10 fully equipped tank divisions on a crash basis. The Moloch of the Pacific War, however, and the many defeats after 1942 prevented the attainment of almost all such expansionary programs. Not one armored division has been activated by December 1941. Whereas Rhea looks more at the limited resource situation and strategic shift that limited the tank forces. Yet this decision was already taken in 1936. So before the mixed brigade was deployed in China, as Ria notes, furthermore, the decision in 1936 to expand the Army's air arm and homeland air defense network shifted resources, capital and technology to aeronautical projects. Japan's industrial base could not simultaneously mass produce aircraft, vehicles and tanks. As late as 1939, factories were manufacturing an average of 28 tanks, all models, per month. Then again, we are talking about different levels here, as pointed out by Justin when I discussed the issue with him. 
He noted that this was likely due to infighting within the Imperial Japanese Army and Cooks notes the visual thinking of some of the higher ups, whereas Rotman might refer to the opposition and or lower ranks. Now since we discussed early tank units in the Imperial Japanese Army, let's talk about the domestic tank development for a bit. The Japanese Army's Technical Bureau was instructed to develop a light tank in 1925. This was the first time developing a tank. The lack of experience resulted in a too heavy tank. Yet in 1929 the Type 89 was finished. Although still too heavy, it was designated as a medium tank and production started in 1931. Ultimately, this led to the first mass-produced tank, the Type 89B, which was fielded in 1934. The gasoline engine Type 94 tankette was fielded in 1935. This was provided with a small open-top fully tracked trailer of 3 quarter ton capacity, enabling it to deliver ammunition and supplies to frontline units. Meanwhile, the Japanese got their hands on the British Vickers light tank. According to one source, the tank's gasoline engine caught fire, which convinced the Japanese to go for diesel fueled tanks. Japanese cavalry arm was also not happy with the Type 89's speed, which led to the development of the Type 92 cavalry tank. It had a mere 3.5 tons. For contrast, the Panzer I had 5.4 tons. Type 92 similarly had weak armor and two machine guns. Although it was used extensively in China, overall it was not a successful design. So since the Type 89 was too slow and the Type 92 too weakly armed and armored, there was a new design brought forward in 1933. This led to the Type 95, better known as the Hago. It had a weight of 7 tons and was armed with a 37mm gun and two machine guns. The crew consisted of a commander, driver and hull machine gun. As such, the commander acted also as a gunner. Since it was equipped with the same diesel engine as the Type 89B, but had considerable less weight, it had far better mobility. A prototype was sent to the Independent Mixed Brigade and based upon these experiences, a second prototype was constructed in 1935. One major difference to the prototype was the second machine gun, which was located in the rear part of the turret. So much for the Hago. Let's look at one of the most significant battles in Northeast Asia before the outbreak of the Asia-Pacific War. Namely, the Battles of Kalkingol, as usually called in Western and Russian historiography. The most decisive of these battles is called the Nomohan Incident in Japanese historiography. In short, the Japanese didn't do particularly well. Let's look at the engagement in July. The Japanese infantry lacked anti-tank weapons. And the Soviets had a far greater number of vehicles in this area, with about 550 tanks and 450 armored cars. This was in contrast to the Japanese with about 73 tanks and 64 tankettes. Although initially Japanese tanks managed to penetrate Soviet defenses, they took heavy losses in the process, and there were several issues. Instead of attacking en masse, Japanese tankers made piecemeal attacks because of poor command and control procedures and overconfidence in their tanks' capabilities on the battlefield. They tried to exploit any opportunity, no matter how slight, and to press forward regardless of losses. So at gunners riddled Japanese tanks, leaving half of them smoldering frags. The Logan notes that 42 out of 73 tanks were put out of commission, yet that all but 13 tanks could be recovered. The tank units were finally called back after about one week and sent into garrison. Nevertheless, the experience at Kalkingo led to various improvements within the Japanese tank arm, particularly Type 95 and 97 were redesigned. Yet that is something for an upcoming video. To summarize, although Japanese tanks are often considered a laughing stock, considering the many restrictions the Japanese were facing, the results are quite formidable. Not only did they design and produce their own tanks, they also built up a considerable number of tanks before the start of the Asia-Pacific War. Even though in 1936 the army had shifted to extension of its air arm and the navy was the main recipient of steel. Additionally, we should not forget that the Japanese opted for light and medium tanks for very good reasons. One among them was, to support the army's forward operating strategy, tanks would have to be shipped from Japan to the continent. Size and weight then had to be considered in relation to a transport loading and offloading capacity. Balancing all these requirements, the army opted for light, 10 tons or less, and medium tanks, 
15 tons or less. As so often, a closer look shows that stuff made a lot more sense in the context of the time and the geostrategic restrictions of the powers involved. A big thank you here to Justin for helping out with sources, critical input and feedback. Thank you here to Andrew for reviewing the script. Thanks to QAZ for helping out with Japanese symbols. Also special thanks to Jack, Michael, Peter and Anna for sending me books that enhance this video. And all my other supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar. Thank you to the Tank Museum at Bowington for inviting me to Tankfest 2019. Source the list in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.